All right, welcome to today's webinar, Functional Medicine Autoimmune Disease Lab Testing. So what we're going to talk about is you know, exactly that. What are some of the um, options for autoimmune disease lab testing in the functional medicine world? So what do you need to know about yourself if you suffer from an autoimmune disease? So this, uh, this webinar goes into a, a lot of information about the labs. We're going to look at some examples. We're going to look at some, some, uh, you know, some just so that the options that are out there. Um, but first, I think it's really important to give some definitions uh, so that you know what we're testing, what we could be looking for, the relevance of it, etc. Because there's a lot of information uh, in this content that we're going to go through tonight. So the first thing I want to talk about are the three stages of autoimmune disease, okay? And so the first stage, stage one, is called silent autoimmunity. And what that means is that your body has antibodies present. And that's a really big thing that I wanna take a second and talk about is, is just the antibodies in stage one. Uh, we could see this in kids, we could see this really at any age. And it could be years before an autoimmune disease develops or before we move into stage two or stage three, but the antibodies are really, really important. What an antibody is, is basically when your immune system has flagged something as uh, bad, okay? So it might flag uh, the flu virus or it might flag uh, gluten or it might flag your thyroid. And that is exactly what autoimmune disease is 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 when the immune system has uh, lost the ability to differentiate self from non-self. So rather than just flagging things in the environment, viruses, bacteria, pathogens, toxins, chemicals, uh, the, the body has begun to place these flags onto your own tissue. So if you have thyroid antibodies, your body has flagged your thyroid as a problem and when the immune system uh, attacks, it's gonna see those flags and think, oh, we need to attack this. Or if it's flagged your brain, if it's flagged the myelin uh, basic protein uh, on, your, on your brain. And, and what f they flag is proteins, okay? So it flags proteins, antibodies form to proteins, um, and, and, you know, if it flags your joint tissue, it's rheumatoid arthritis. If it flags your uh, a, a adrenals, it's a, a adrenal cortex antibodies, etc. So that's stage one. So in stage one, there are antibodies that are present. Uh, we all have antibodies to lots and lots and lots of different things that aren't necessarily a problem until they enter your body again, but we all have lots of antibodies. But so stage one could be there for a long time. So stage two then is autoimmune reactivity, meaning there's starting to be a reaction and you're starting to notice symptoms. The patient is starting to notice symptoms. So let's say for thyroid disease, they're starting to get fatigue, they're starting to get hair loss, they're starting to get um, um, brittle nails are starting to have dry skin, constipation, etc. But they go in to their doctor and they're told their labs look normal. And this is uh, very, very common, this stage two autoimmune disease reactivity where people are starting to feel bad, but their labs still look normal, okay? And, and you could be in that stage for a really, really long time then stage three is where you're able to be diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and you have irreversible tissue damage. So in the case of a thyroid, your TSH has risen enough that you're diagnosed hypothyroid and then you go on thyroid replacement hormone. Let me give two better examples of this to just kind of illustrate these three stages, okay? First one, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So let's say in stage one, you have antibodies present, but you feel fine. So you'd very rarely find out about this because they're never going to test for antibodies unless you go in with symptoms and complaints. But let's say we did a you know, full panel on a kid and they had antibodies um, to, their, to their connective uh, tissue or their joint spaces like a rheumatoid factor. Uh, so that's, that's silent uh, autoimmunity. Then let's say 10 years later, they're not able to make a fist with their hand and they go in and they get an x-ray 
and the x-ray looks completely normal still, but they're starting to express symptoms. They're starting to have joint pain, they're starting to have some inflammation, but the x-ray still looks normal. Stage three would be maybe five years later, they go in and they get an x-ray and they say, oh, there's erosion of the joint spaces indicative of rheumatoid arthritis. Let's give the other example, multiple sclerosis. So let's say silent autoimmunity stage one, we have antibodies present. We have myelin basic protein antibodies present, but no signs, no symptoms. We just know they're present um, and we know that they're there. That could last a really, really long time, or it could be really, really quick progression. It kind of depends on the lifestyle factors. It depends on some of the other inflammatory factors of whether or not that fire is going to turn into a bigger fire or kind of stay more contained. But that's stage one. Let's say stage two, patient starts having neurological symptoms. They start having uh, uh, dizziness and balance problems. They start feeling weird tingling sensations. They start feeling what's called the MS hug, but they start having symptoms and they go in for an MRI and they say the MRI looks clean and we don't know why you're having these symptoms try this antidepressant or try this anti-inflammatory or, you know, try, try this. Then fast forward uh, five years, 10 years, whatever it may be, patient goes in with symptoms again, they do an MRI and they say, I'm sorry, we see white matter lesions on your M MRI indicative of multiple sclerosis. So these antibodies are what's known as predictive antibodies also. We now know that Alzheimer's has predictive autoantibodies that could detect it years and years in advance. Things like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, all these diseases, all these autoimmune things have predictive autoantibodies that tell us maybe stage one long before we move to stage two reactivity and long before somebody's uh, digressed enough that they're in stage three. So in stage three, there's irreversible tissue damage. There's nothing we're going to do to rebuild that damage, but we can still try to keep the fire at bay. Uh, what, I, what I talk about a lot with this is, you know, a fire. It's inflammation. It's an immune response. But you could have a fire like a candle sitting on your desk and it's well controlled. Is fire still dangerous? Absolutely, but it's well controlled. It poses no problems at all. You knock that candle off onto the ground, your rug catches on fire. All of a sudden, you got a pretty big problem, right? Uh, you got to put that fire out or keep it under control more. Then let's say the whole room catches on fire and there's irreversible damage to your home whole nother ball game than a candle sitting on the table, whole nother ball game than the rug catching on fire also. So we're going to use that metaphor a lot. I use that metaphor a lot just with these three stages and just with inflammation in general. So another thing that's important to just touch on before we jump into the lab testing is just, you know, some of the things that can cause autoimmune disease because if, if, if we're testing and what are we trying to figure out? Well, we're trying to figure out how the person's functioning but also we're trying to figure out, well, what caused that fire? You know, if that candle got knocked down onto the ground, how did that happen so we can make sure that that never happens again? So some of the causes, you know, a genetic predisposition is a, is a, a part of this. So it's like, you know, you knock a candle into a pool, nothing's going to happen. You knock a candle onto a, a pile of uh, old papers or something, then, you know, you're a lot more susceptible. So there is a genetic predisposition, a lot of the HLA genes, uh, human leukocyte antigen, I think, uh, genes, all right, um, HLA-DR, HLA-DQ, HLA-B27, um, a lot of those genes cause a, a, pre a genetic predisposition. There's also a big component of intestinal permeability uh, and, and gut issues and food sensitivities, and, and that's really important. And I think that anybody watching a webinar like this has probably heard by now that roughly 70% of your immune system resides around your gut. It's called the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, and it's responsible for, for kind of making that differentiation between good stuff and bad stuff. So uh, there's a lot of gut issues with a lot of autoimmune diseases. There could also be uh, toxins or chemical 
antigens, things that made it in that didn't necessarily cross your leaky gut, but maybe they were uh, inhaled, maybe they were injected in, maybe they were, uh, you know, other ways that toxins can, maybe they're across the skin, maybe they're from your mouth. The ways that toxins can get into your body can create this autoimmune reactivity. Um, or the last one is infections. So uh, things like you know you get you get Epstein Barr, you get mono, or you get the flu, you get a cold, you get um, you get food poisoning, and all of a sudden you've got IBS. Uh, that's uh, the the most like a prominent uh, IBS D. Uh, theory right now is that it's autoimmune, that something like Campylobacter, jejuni, uh, food poisoning, you got it, and then all of a sudden you now have autoimmunity and you have IBS. Um, and, and so the causes are really important, but along those same lines, what are some of the triggers? So things like foods, foods can be a trigger. Uh, gluten is, is a huge one. Um, we're going to look at some gluten things, uh, but gluten is a, a huge one. There's known gluten cross reactivity with many different tissues, with thyroid tissue, with brain tissue, uh, cerebellar tissue, etc. Um, so gluten is the biggest one. Dairy is probably the second biggest one. Then there's other categories of foods like nightshades, like lectins, that if you're eating them and they're, they're a problem for you, they could be triggering your autoimmune disease. And, and really quickly, it's important to talk about once you have an autoimmune disease, you, you have it for life, but you go into periods of relapses and remissions or flares and remissions. So the cause might have been, you know, somebody knocking the, the candle onto the floor. Um, and, but the, the, the flare is like, or the trigger rather is like, Somebody pouring, thinking they have a, a cup of water, and it's actually a cup of gasoline. Um, so we want to look out for triggers, especially when it comes to testing. We want to know what's triggering this autoimmune condition. And a lot of people in my clinic, they come in knowing they have an autoimmune disease. They come in because they've already been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or MS or, or what have you. Um, and so we're not looking to diagnose them necessarily. We're looking for keeping it in remission for as long as we can. So we want to evaluate these triggers, foods being a big one. Another one is chemical exposures. Maybe you somebody has uh, a, a autoimmune disease in remission and they go get their hair done and there's, there's in a cloud of hairspray and all of a sudden their autoimmune disease flares or they... They're in a place where there's a lot of air pollution that's associated with autoimmune disease, lots of different chemical exposures associated with autoimmune disease. Another one is an infection or a reactivation. Let's say somebody gets a, a flu and all of a sudden their autoimmune disease reactivates and their joint pain returns or their neurosymptoms return or they go into a, a relapse or an infection that they've had lying dormant for years like a Epstein-Barr virus is very, very famous for this. That's the monovirus, but it's a, it's a, it's a herpes virus. But Epstein-Barr virus can reactivate. The infection can reactivate, and it throws off your immune system and can put somebody into a, a flare. Uh, hormone fluctuations, poor blood sugar control, um, things like that can, can trigger autoimmune disease. Stress can trigger autoimmune disease. Poor sleep can trigger autoimmune disease. Anything that kind of throws your body off can trigger an autoimmune disease. And we have some videos on our website that, that go into further detail of this. But in one of them, I say, you know, just take your hand and scratch it. Scratch, scratch, scratch. You keep scratching. Eventually, that's going to get inflamed. Eventually, that tissue is going to bleed. Eventually, it's going to cause damage. And so all you need to do is stop scratching. But what are the scratchers? What are the fingernails? Foods toxins, uh, stress, hidden infections, and, and hormone um, fluctuations, hormone problems, or the scratcher. So that's just a good, a good metaphor there. Now, along these lines, let's say like, well, how do we know which one it is for you? That's what's really, 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 really hard clinically. Um, and, and what we're going to go through today is the testing, but the testing is if we tested all these things, it's possible but it'd be really, really expensive. 
So the most important test that anybody can have, the most important thing that anybody, especially with an autoimmune disease, uh, can do is get a good history and intake. That's so crucial to get a good history and intake. Um, and, and so like we sit down with a patient for 90 minutes and a lot of times that's not anywhere near long enough. But like how can we determine if it's a, a chemical exposure or it was a food exposure or they got an infection, well, we have to ask them. We have to figure out their history. We have to see their symptoms and see what they lead us towards with this. Uh, so how does the patient sleep? How stressed are they? Are they, uh, um, you know, what is their job? What is their personal relationships like? What is their their schedule like? Do they travel often? Do they, have they had uh, chronic issues since they were a kid? Have they had allergies? Do they, have they had a hysterectomy? Have they had, you know, all these different things? I mean, we take a really long time to go through the history. And we also do something called a metabolic assessment form that just points us to different systems that could be malfunctioning and it can lead us, you know, in the right direction with what testing we even want to or need to perform here. Do they have signs of poor blood sugar control? Do they get uh, fatigued after a meal? Do they get energy after a meal? Do they get hangry without a meal? Do they have uh, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, malabsorption? Do they have GI issues? Have they, do they take heartburn medication? Do they have you know these different things? Uh, that is just so critically important. Then one of the things that, that can be tested and that you want to know, you know, one of the concerns with autoimmune disease is once you have one, you often have more and either have more or will develop more or have an other antibodies. But poly autoimmunity is, is such a huge concern. So you want to know what tissues are being attacked. So say that somebody comes in with rheumatoid arthritis or they come in with Hashimoto's, but do they have pernicious anemia, uh, which means they don't absorb things like B12 very well? Do they have intestinal autoimmunity? Do they have celiac disease? Do they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Do they have any autoimmune reactivity against their gut? Do they have uh, other tissues that are being attacked that they don't know about? And, you know, the bottom question, does it matter? Sometimes the answer is no. You know, if somebody comes in and they have joint pain that they can hardly walk and can't make a fist with their hands, you know, how relevant is it if it's attacking their thyroid or if it's attacking their brain? You know, it might not be based on their goals. How important is it? It's super important to know. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes that's a very relevant question and sometimes it's not which other tissues are being attacked. And I'm going to show you in a second uh, an example of a multiple tissue autoimmune reactivity test where they test 24 different tissues and just kind of throw it out there like what all is being attacked we know you have autoimmune processes going on what all is it impacting and then like we said what is triggering the attack is that's one of the things we're trying to figure out is it gluten is it dairy is it another food is it stress is it sleep is it chemicals is it infection is it you know x y or z fill in the blank uh, that's one of the big questions that we want to have answered here. So going back to, you know, what tissue is being attacked, here's a, an example of somebody who came into my office knowing that she had rheumatoid arthritis. And we weren't looking at all the tissues. We were just doing a pretty basic panel. And we found out that she also has Hashimoto's. And really, a lot of her symptoms are more like Hashimoto symptoms than they are rheumatoid arthritis uh, symptoms. But so anything, these are the thyroid antibodies Anything that's lab high is diagnostic for Hashimoto's. So anything above one on the TG antibody is diagnostic. This is the TPO antibody. Those two are diagnostic for Hashimoto's. I'll tell you the TPO antibody is present in something like 80 to 90% of Hashimoto's. It's, it's the most commonly present if somebody has Hashimoto's that's generally what they mean the TG antibody is more like 60 percent of the time and sometimes people have both as you'll see in a minute but either one or the other is diagnostic for Hashimoto so there's a positive TG antibody there here's a positive TPO antibody but but the my, my point of this one is what stage is it in so this patient 
has Hashimoto's, but if you look at her thyroid numbers and, you know, you don't need to know uh, what they all mean right now. I'm not going to go through them all, but they look pretty good. Her TSH 3.27, pretty, pretty good. Her T4, 7.6, that's, that's quite good. Um, her T3 is pretty decent, her free T3, everything looks fine. So if you saw just her thyroid panel without her antibodies, say, hey, your thyroid's functioning fine, but this patient does have symptoms. So based on this lab, we could tell that she's either stage one or stage two autoimmune disease. I'll tell you that she did have symptoms when we measured, so she was a stage two Hashimoto's. Now this next one, and you can see that one was the, this one's the TG antibody, this one's the TPO antibody, this one's got both. But this person is stage three because this person has hypothyroidism. Their TSH is 5.07, lab high. When it's lab high, it's diagnostic for hypothyroidism. Um, yeah, so the TG antibody is above one, just barely, but it's above one, it's lab high, it's di diagnostic. The TPO antibody is lab high at 95, diagnostic, but a stage three. So just a, a few differences there. And then here's this example of the, the multiple tissue antibody uh, test from Cyrex Labs. A lot of the labs we're going to go over today are from Cyrex Labs because they are the world's leader in autoimmune reactivity testing um, and the, by far the most trusted, most reliable lab for autoimmune disease testing. Um, but you can see this person, she came in actually for anxiety. We discovered some things going on in her gut so we've got autoimmunity, and, and we wanted to see, well, where, where else is it? So she has uh, anything in the green, okay, is, uh, is normal, but anything in the yellow or the red are both clinically relevant, okay? So um, red is obviously worse, but anything in the yellow is certainly clinically relevant. So she has antibodies to intrinsic factor, which binds B12 and takes it, into the body uh, in, in the digestive system. So um, that's like a, a pernicious anemia. She wouldn't be diagnosed with pernicious anemia based on her other labs, but that's essentially what it is. There's autoimmunity uh, attacking that protein that helps transport that uh, vitamin or mineral B, B12 cobalamin. Um, uh, TPO, so we've seen that one before. So she has Hashimoto's. Um, myocardial peptide, that's a heart tissue. So she has uh, autoimmunity against her heart, that's not great. And she has autoimmunity against phospholipids, antiphospholipid antibodies, which is a thing. Antiphospholipid syndrome causes like some really weird stuff, uh, patchy hair loss, ITP, it's associated with ITP, which is idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpurea, I think. Um, ITP is a lot easier, um, but yeah, there's uh, an example of the multiple tissue. So what are the things that we want to see, you know, in, in our office? Uh, let's say somebody comes in and they either think they have autoimmunity or they know they have autoimmunity. Well, the first thing that we want to see on everybody, okay, whether they come in with, uh, you know, anything, anxiety, constipation, diarrhea, uh, thyroid problems, low energy, brain fog, whatever, fill in the blank with X, Y, or Z symptom, we want to see some basic blood tests. So with autoimmunity, some of the things that are particularly relevant, uh, a CBC is relevant on everybody. A CMP is relevant on everybody. They're both very, very inexpensive. I know that in our office, you know, th this isn't the total price of everything, but they're about $5 a piece. So a CBC, a complete blood count, tells us a lot about how the immune system is functioning. I want to know the neutrophils. I want to know the lymphocytes. I want to see if there's high absolute neutrophils to see if maybe the person's uh, fighting a, a bacterial infection. Maybe there's high lymphocytes that show that it's more of a viral infection. And maybe there's high eosinophils that show that it might be an allergy or maybe more of a parasite. And, and that's just incredibly, incredibly important. It also tells us some things like, are they anemic? Do they have uh, enough hemoglobin, hematocrit? Are they methylating well with their MCV? Um, the, these things are just so important, so we do this on every single person. A CMP is a comprehensive metabolic panel. has things like uh, 
liver enzymes, important kidney function and filtration rate, their blood glucose, really, really important, um, electrolytes, just some really important stuff on the proteins, uh, you know, globulins and, and albumins and things like that. Really, really important to see a CBC and a CMP. Another thing that I call basic because it's basic in our office, we do it on everybody, is vitamin D. And it's, you know, it's basic for everybody, but it's so relevant to this conversation. Vitamin D helps support regulatory T cells, which dampen autoimmunity. Vitamin D has powerful immunomodulatory effects. And it's just really, really, really important that it be high and adequate if you suffer from an inflammatory autoimmune condition. It's anti-inflammatory, it's immunomodulatory, like I said. And we see all the time people in the tanks, like like maybe in the middle of summer and they're tan, they might be 31. And below 30 is medically insufficient. We see medically insufficient all the time. Below 20 is medically deficient. And we see that you know, not as often really, like to be 17, 19, it's, we see it regularly, but we see people all the time, like 29, 30, 31, 32, just like hovering around that insufficiency range. And, and for autoimmune disease, I would say, you know, you want it to be 60 plus. Um, and then inflammatory markers. These are easy, but they're so, so, so important. Things like C-reactive protein. So we can just see generally how inflamed a person is. Ferritin is another acute phase reactant that can tell inflammation. Sedimentation rate is common in autoimmune world. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually more rare to see that elevated. But sometimes people will come in and they'll be like, gosh, I feel so inflamed. I can't lift my shoulder. It just feels like it's on fire. Like it, it just doesn't move well. And their labs will be completely normal. So that gets really, really tricky with some of these inflammatory markers. But let's say we see somebody that comes in. Um, like yesterday, I saw two people. One was like, two people that I'm thinking of with this. Uh, one, her inflammation at the beginning was like, C-reactive protein was like eight point something. And it came down to two point something, good change. The other one started at like six something and is down to maybe four something when we retested. So inflammation coming down is just a good thing to see if you have autoimmune disease. Um, but then there's also some advanced blood testing. So going back to the inflammation that sometimes you can't see that, there are other inflammatory markers that we don't run very often, but things like complement proteins that are on here, cytokines like TNF-alpha is not that expensive, um, TGF-beta, TGF-beta, yeah, yeah, TGF-beta is another one that we don't do very often, but kind of tells a little bit of more of the status of the immune system for sure. Um, another one that tells more of the status of the immune system T and B lymphocytes you see on there and natural killer profile. Now, I love seeing this. It's just really expensive. Um, so if somebody has a crazy immuno problem, you, you know, uh, the, the, the cash price on this is like 250 bucks maybe to add it on to a panel. So it gets expensive when these things add up. Now, I skipped over and going in, you know, wrong order with this slide. But the antibodies also would be more of an advanced lab testing. You could see thyroid antibodies. You could see rheumatoid things. You could see like uh, you could see a lot of antibodies just through the blood. And and what we use is LabCorp. So that's what I'm talking about right now is kind of basic and advanced things that we add onto our panels with our LabCorp serum blood testing as opposed to our more advanced functional medicine testing where we're going to look at more of the Cyrex things. Also the infections like Epstein-Barr, Cytomegalo, other herpetic things, Coxsackie virus, uh, Epstein-Barr is herpetic, Cytomegalovirus herpetic, HHV, HHV6, um, HSV1 and 2. Um, but yeah, it's, it, you can do that a lot too. So here's an example. This is a, a ANA. Uh, and I, you know, I skimmed over that on this. ANA is uh, it's really, really tricky. Okay, so a ton of people come in and they have lupus-like symptoms or they have RA-like symptoms, but their ANA was negative, so they're just told you're fine or you're normal. ANA can switch back and forth from mildly positive to negative to, you know, there's a lot of different nuances to ANA interpretation. It can be uh, 
different titers of ANA. It can be speckled or non-speckled. It's, it's kind of weird. And I've seen people go positive ANA to negative ANA and, and vice versa. Uh, but if you've ever had a positive ANA, it matters. It, it is uh, clinically relevant big time. Anybody that has antibodies against their nucleus of their DNA, that is not good. So that's what ANA stands for, anti-nuclear antibodies. And it is uh, the prognosis of a patient's case uh, goes down pretty considerably if they've ever had a positive ANA. It's, it's tricky to kind of figure out their, their case. Um, so here's an ANA comprehensive panel. I'm not going to explain it, but you'll just see some things on there. I don't even do this, this one. Uh, Sjogren's um, anti-chromatin, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies. So a lot of cool things here associated with lupus, mixed connective tissue diseases, uh, Sjogren's, etc. Here's one that is from our office. It's a uh, Epstein Barr um, uh, reactivation or past infection, or just looking at Epstein Barr stuff. Um, so three different antig antibodies on there. You can see that like this nuclear antigen uh, positive is above 21. This person's at 438, so they have quite a bit of an antibody response to uh, Epstein Barr there. But if you look at this chart down here, plus plus shows that they have a, a past infection um, or they might have a, a, a more recent reactivation and, and you know, I'm not going to go into the background of what was going on with that patient, but that is something that we were evaluating was to see if anything like that was going on. But so let's move into gut autoimmune testing. So I mentioned that there's a lot of gut components to autoimmune disease but not only leaky gut, dysbiosis, uh, things like that. That's important for anybody with autoimmune disease because like we said, the immune system is, is centralized around the gut. But is there autoimmunity to the gut itself is really, really important um, it, to rule in or to rule out. So is there autoimmunity in the gut? Is there celiac disease? Is there leaky gut or intestinal permeability? Are there food triggers that are fueling this? Is there what's called endotoxemia, uh, which is very, very inflammatory? And is the immune system involved in this? Really, really important question. So first off, let me show you this uh, chart here from Nature Reviews and Gastroenterology and uh, Hepatology. But th so the, the, the point of this is this top part where there's all these bugs and all this stuff, that's your gut. So you see here that's bacteria, it's food, it's passing through the gut. And down here is more your body and your immune system and your bloodstream. And so your gut is a single layer uh, epithelium. The first layer is a single layer. And it really, it's really important as kind of a wall and for permeability and leaky gut. And what this picture shows, this graphic shows, is a a progression okay so number one over here is normal permeability meaning good things can get in bad things can't and you know there's normal permeability it's not impermeable but it lets it's selectively permeable like it's supposed to be and you have what's called mucosal tolerance what tolerance means is that your immune system is able to recognize good stuff from bad stuff so that it doesn't attack good stuff, it only attacks bad stuff. When you lose tolerance, that is a gateway to uh, autoimmunity. Your body loses the tolerance, loses the ability to differentiate self from non-self, then it's like, who should I attack? I'm going to attack everybody. And it starts to attack self tissue. So one here is normal permeability. Everything is all good. Number two is you begin to have a minor defect of that barrier. And so when you have a minor defect, things can begin like mucosal tolerance can, can happen or mucosal tolerance is what you want or you could begin to develop a food allergy or food sensitivity. You start to have antibodies against these foods. Your body starts to say, hey, this is kind of foreign. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mark it and flag it with these antibodies so that I can attack it if it ever comes in here again. Or, and, and it can also lead to this food allergies can lead to this vicious cycle of inflammation. So this is kind of where this begins. So one is good. Two, you're starting to have a problem. Three, increased permeability. It leads to more food allergies. 
leads to a vicious cycle of inflammation. The inflammation leads to more food allergies. The inflammation damages the gut lining. The inflammation leads to tissue damage. Not good there. And then four, you have tissue destruction and you have a massive influx of bad stuff, let's say. So this is something that needs to be evaluated. Some people have, some people are at one, some people are at two, some people are at three or at four. So if somebody has food sensitivities, but they don't have tissue damage, then we need to maybe support tolerance. We don't necessarily need to support the gut lining as much. We need to support more tolerance, but we can measure these and kind of look at some of these things. So Cyrex Array 2 looks at intestinal permeability. Now, the interesting thing about this is everybody has a leaky gut from time to time. So, uh, you know, I've said before, Dr. Perlmutter, David Perlmutter says, how do you know if somebody has a leaky gut if they have a vowel in their name? But any of us do. If we get uh, the flu, we're going to have a leaky gut. We get food poisoning, we're going to have a leaky gut. We go out drinking on a Saturday night, we're going to have leaky gut. And then it seals back up and it's, t- it's uh, transient. And it... it you know, we all have a selectively permeable gut that, that the permeability changes. But what you want to know is, is there autoimmunity causing leaky gut all the time? Um, so what this test shows, three things. One, the first one, actomycin, shows structural damage to the cell. So that's number four up here, these cells over here that have been structurally damaged. They don't even look like the other ones, and they, they're, they're structurally damaged. The other one is occludins and zonulins, which are tight junction proteins. So is your immune system attacking occludins or is it attacking zonulins, which zonulin kind of unzips the gut, opens up the gut. Occludins are tight junction proteins and they hold those cells together tightly. We don't want those being ripped apart or we don't want autoimmunity attacking those in between. And third is lipopolysaccharide or what's called endotoxemia is, is your immune system attacking this component called LPS or lipopolysaccharide? Dr. Gundry, who's gained fame in recent years with the lectin conversation, he says, I, I don't curse, but I call these LPSs little pieces of you know what. Um, and, you know, LPS, um, it, he said, because they're so inflammatory, they can inflame the liver, they can inflame the brain, they can inflame the joints. If they get into your bloodstream, they can inflame everything. And if your immune system is attacking these things, it is not a good thing. So here's an example of, of this, uh, this test. So this person is beyond number three on our chart up here. They're past number three and they're moving into number four. So they, they're, they're out of range with the occludins and zonulins, meaning that their tight junctions are being attacked, opening the door to intestinal permeability. It's been going on for so long, I mean, you can, you can hypothesize that, I guess, but there's been inflammation, enough inflammation, that it has damaged the cell walls. Now, roughly speaking, actomycin antibodies that's, that's going to take six months to correct, roughly speaking. Occludin and zonulin might take more like three months to correct and fix the, the tight junction proteins and kind of support those things and support tolerance. But we can kind of uh, extrapolate some things out of this, this testing. Here's somebody else that just shows uh, high off the charts uh, for LPS. So they have endotoxemia. Their immune system isn't attacking their tight junctions. Their immune system isn't attacking the cell wall um, in the cyto- the structure of the cell. Um, it's attacking the LPSs, which L- it's a component of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. But it, what it means is oftentimes that you have uh, dysbiosis. You have too many bad bugs and not enough good bugs. And this LPS has been going on long enough that, that it's you know, affecting... It's getting, it's crossing the gut, but your immune system's actually flagged it and is attacking it. And I'll tell you, this person came in for anxiety, um, and we also found through another test, a urinary organic acid test, we found that she had some neuroinflammation, and they inject people with LPS to create neuroinflammation, not people, 
rats more like. I don't think they do it in humans. Um, but they inject rats and create anxiety by injecting LPS because it's so inflammatory. So you can Google that and you can find out about that. But so through multiple lab tests, this person with anxiety had brain inflammation. Where was the brain inflammation coming from? It was coming from the gut. What was it coming from? It was coming from LPS and the immune system attacking that LPS. Uh, another uh, panel to look at gut health is Cyrex Array 3X. So this is a gluten sensitivity panel, but most tests might just test like wheat. Or if you go to your physician and you're looking for celiac disease, they'll just check gliadin. And gliadin, there are a lot more proteins in the wheat proteome other than just gliadin. And even within gluten, there's other proteins other than just the gliadin that's tested. So there are a lot of false negatives where someone's told, hey, you don't need to avoid gluten. Good news. You, your gliadin was, was low enough that you don't have celiac disease and keep eating whatever you want. But that's not the case. Um, so this panel shows that. It also shows other things that are in wheat like non-gluten proteins or agglutinins, which are lectins, so it could alert us to more of a lectin problem. And then it also shows this panel the gluten-mediated uh, tissue transglutaminases. So these are uh, tissue antibodies. So the other ones are food antibodies. These are tissue antibodies showing that gluten is creating this response towards different tissues, and we'll talk about those here in a second. But here's one of them. So this person has antibodies here to gliadin toxic peptides. So it's not gliadin like alpha gliadin or gamma gliadin or omega gliadin. It's gliadin toxic peptides, which is just a, a little bit different. But if you weren't testing for that, you would not find that. But this person has that. And they also have tissue transglutaminase 2, uh, which is the marker that they look at for celiac disease. Now, this person doesn't have celiac disease, but it's very, very similar. So should this person be gluten-free for the rest of their life? I mean, you tell me, but I'd say absolutely. How about this person? Non-gluten proteins, non-gluten proteins. So other proteins that they don't have a name, just non-gluten proteins. Gluten, glutenin. So all the gliadins, they're okay on actually. And on general wheat, they're okay on, so interesting. But there are some proteins in that wheat molecule, wheat, wheat uh, you know, kernel or whatever, that they are absolutely reacting to. Then they're high in TTG2, celiac. Um, not, they're not diagnosed with celiac, but that's the marker for celiac. Then they're high in TTG3, which is the skin, which we're going to talk about here in a second. So just very, very interesting. Should this person be gluten-free for the rest of their life? You tell me, but I'd say absolutely. Now what happens with this, and we're going to talk about these in a sec, I said, but the gluten and these proteins trigger this TTG2 and, and cause tissue destruction in the gut. So that's really the concern with celiac, isn't that you know, oh, you can't eat gluten because you have a sensitivity to it. The concern is when you eat gluten, it causes tissue destruction and it opens up those tight junctions, allowing other things to get in and, and causes a T-cell, a massive T-cell attack and leads to other autoimmune diseases. So that's the concern with celiac. And it's the same concern with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. It's just not the exact same diagnostically. How about this person? You think they should be gluten-free for the rest of their life? So, uh, we out of range, out of range, higher than what the lab test showed. So, their IgA, so that's in their gut, uh, secretory IgA, off the charts here. Um, wheat germ agglutinin, which is a lectin. It's a sticky substance that... that uh, kind of holds things together. Non-gluten proteins here, non-gluten proteins here, gliadin toxic peptides, native and deaminated gliadin, gamma gliadin, the alpha gliadins were okay, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then down here, uh, high, oops, high in tissue transglutaminase 2, high or equivocal in 2, TTG3, TTG3, and TTG6, which is the brain. So looking here, kind of zooming in on those, 
TTG2, like I said, that's the intestinal cells and the tight junctions. Um, so these are gluten-mediated tissue transglutaminases, meaning they help break down gluten. Um, but yeah, two, three is the skin, like I said, dermatitis hepatiformis. Um, and TTG6 is the brain uh, associated with gluten ataxia, cerebellar things, cross reactivities too. Um, so yeah, not, not good. This person should be gluten free for sure. Another one in the gut is uh, there's a SIBO panel just to tell us. Now SIBO isn't necessarily autoimmune, but it can tell us if there's an autoimmune component to SIBO. So you know, uh, SIBO can be done through a breath test. SIBO can be kind of indicated through an organic acids test, not really diagnostic for sure. But, um, you know, a lot of times SIBO is based on the symptoms and you're just kind of knowing if, if you think that that's what they have. But anyway, this can tell us if the immune system is attacking the bacteria or if it's attacking the cells itself. So like in this person, for example, there's no uh, attack on the cytotoxins. There's a, an attack more on the cytoskeletal proteins, so it's damaging the actual st structure of the cell itself and causing tissue destruction of those gut cells. Um, another one while we're still in the gut, this one's in the gut, but it tests for a lot of different things. So we're looking at triggers still, but it's array 14. It's called a mucosal immune reactivity. So in your digestive system, you have a, a, a different immune system called your mucosal immune system. It's the first line of defense. And your IgG immune response, which is what you want to have tested for food sensitivities, for, for uh, other antibodies, oftentimes you, you need them all. They're all relevant. But this one is more of your IgA and IgM, your first line defenders. But different things that can trigger inflammation that can trigger uh, IBS, that can trigger gut autoimmunity and lead to bigger things down the road. But it, th this one's great because it's comprehensive. It looks at uh, a lot of different triggers, not just foods, but some of the bigger foods, some of the bigger toxins, some of the bigger infections, um, and tells us a lot about what's going on in the gut. It's also great for kids. It's uh, salivary. The rest of them are all blood. So this one can be tested in the saliva. And kids also don't have a fully formed uh, IgG immune system. So sometimes the sensitivity testing uh, isn't quite as accurate on them. But here's array 14. So this person, I'll tell you, this person has MS and is in a wheelchair. Um, so, and is young. Um, this is dairy. So let's go through this. LPS, we've talked about. Occludens and zinulins, we've talked about. Those are the tight junction proteins. Actomycin, we've talked about. That's the gut cell itself. ASCA, ANSA antibodies, those are like uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, you want to know those. Um, some vasculitis things. Calprotectin is like an inflammatory, uh, anti-inflammatory thing in the gut. Here's your glutens or your wheat things, your wheat, wheat germ of glutenin, your transglutaminase, some of the things we looked at on the last test. Egg, soy, corn, dairy, aflatoxin, which is a mold that's commonly found in uh, stored foods, peanuts, uh, etc. BPA, uh, you know, you see it in your plastics, like BPA-free. You saw me drinking from my, my mason jar here. Some people ask me, is this moonshine? Um, uh, mercury, mixed heavy metals. Shoot, how did I do that? Um, rotavirus. Myelin basic protein, so that's your myelin in your brain, the blood brain barrier, and immune complexes. So, this person, based on what we see here, has a dairy sensitivity for sure. Mixed heavy metals, huh? MS, neurological autoimmunity, heavy metals reactivity, interesting. Um, and immune complexes. Immune complexes indicates, long story short, that they may have a lectin sensitivity. And if you have a lectin sensitivity, what it can do is it can cause leaky gut without leaky gut because lectins can kind of transport things across the gut uh, wall without having like intestinal permeability at the tight junction. So uh, not good there. Here's another one, same test. Immune complexes, again, a lectin thing and LPS, so some endotoxemia. Uh, but this, one, this test is just really good because it tests all these different things at once. But I've also had some come back negative on this one. It's like, well, 
maybe they don't have mucosal immune reactivity. Uh, I think it's most relevant if somebody has an inflammatory bowel condition. I'll tell you, this person uh, had blood in their stool when we saw them. And we also did a stool test. We also did the lab corp test. So we're kind of correlating all these different things and looking at a, a broad picture here. So the next thing to consider after gut autoimmune testing and triggers is neurological autoimmunity. So we're still looking for, you know, what tissues are being attacked, but like, do you have neurological autoimmunity? And science is now discovering that, that most neurological diseases have a, have, they're inflammatory. And as part of that inflammation, there's an antigen antibody response triggering a lot of that inflammation. Things like multiple sclerosis certainly is autoimmune, but now Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and more have autoimmune components. And there are, like we talked about before, predictive antibodies that can be discovered decades in advance of the diagnosis. So, you know, ask, any, ask somebody, is that worth it to them? I, I, you know, I don't know. But absolutely, I think if you have, auto, or have Alzheimer's in your family, maybe you're an ApoE4 genetic carrier. Um, gosh, yeah, I mean... It's priceless to know that in advance rather than wait. Because, you know, what if you can catch it in stage one and it's there, but you catch it and it's not stage two, you're not having symptoms and it's not stage three, like you, you've lost your memory and now your significant others are trying to help you and you can't remember where your keys are or who they are or, you know, whatever. So if you can catch it in stage one, my gosh, how, how amazing. Um, but here's a neurological autoimmune reactivity screen. So these antibodies are myelin, basic protein, azeolagangliosyde, alpha and beta tubulin, cerebellar antibodies, and synapsin antibodies. Just different proteins in the brain and different parts of the, the synapses and the neurons and the glial cells and the connections that are going on up there. Um, but this person, you take a look at it and... There's five, one, two, three, four, five different antibodies tested on here, tested for IgG, IgA, IgM. She's got them all. Uh, uh, myelin basic protein positive, azeolagangliosyde high, alpha beta tubulin, cerebellar, and synapsin. They're all IgM, which is a first line responder. So it tells us that you know something, something's happened. Recently, and this person has neurological autoimmunity. Crazy stuff. Um, this person has MS, diagnosed MS, white matter lesions on the MRI, symptoms, stage 3. But right now, she has synapsin. So that's the only antibody that we see. So, you know, interesting. Could be that the other ones are more in remission right now. Could be other, other things. But as far as when we did this test, um, that's what's, what's going on there. Some other things that we might want to test for are other are, are triggers. So these are still tissues, right? Uh, gut tissue, a, a neurological tissue. There's a joint, a joint uh, reactivity panel that I didn't put on here. I never do the joint panel because it's like uh, I don't know, you, you know, three hundred bucks. And the the one that we looked at that does twenty four different tissues is let's say four hundred bucks. So I think that if you're going to look at the joints, you might as well look at all 24 tissues. Um, this one is, is maybe a little bit more reasonable and is a little more expanded than that multiple tissue. So if somebody has neuro symptoms, we'll do this one a little bit more often. But um, yeah, that multiple tissue autoimmune reactivity is something we'll look at sometimes if somebody has joint issues. Like we seriously, we see a lot of people that have joint pain and joint inflammation and they've been told that it's not rheumatoid arthritis, but they still want to treat it like rheumatoid arthritis, and they want them to go on prednisone, and they want them to go on um, um, methotrexate a lot of times, which is crazy. Um, and yeah, like uh, sometimes people in their 20s and their 30s, like going on these medications for the rest of their life. So we're trying to figure out a little bit more about what's going on and what's, what's triggering it and trying to help them through that. Um, but some other triggers. Uh, chemicals and infections can be triggers. So l looking at chemicals, it's, it's tough to put a finger on what chemicals you've been exposed to and, and what it triggered your autoimmune disease. Um, but here's one. Aflatoxins, high, that's a mold like I mentioned. 
formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. So, so you know, I, I forget, you know, what this person was expressing, but like, let's say they move into a new house or they get a new hardwood floor and all of a sudden they get crazy symptoms, neuro or joint pain or fatigue or gut symptoms or whatever. Well, they have a reaction to formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. So interesting. Isocyanates, those are in like your yoga mats, uh, trimetallic or trimaletic and phthalic anhydrides, uh, things like phthalates, benzene rings, so let's say cigarettes or auto exhaust, um, I think maybe paints and things, solvents, BPA binding protein, so BPA, there's BPA and BPA binding protein, here's TBPA, tetro, tetrobromobisphenol A, um, TBBPA, um, tetrachloroethylene, parabens in your personal care products, mercury compounds, mixed heavy metals, looking to see what they have a reactivity to. So this person also has a reaction to mercury compounds. So, you know, this person uh, has, to, has to be careful with their exposure to mercury. And if they, like, have amalgam fillings and they want to go get them removed or something, like, that, they might not want to. They might want to just leave them in because, you know, you want to remove the source all the time, but if it's going to trigger an immune response... It could be uh, pretty bad news there. Um, this one, benzene ring. So, you know, are you exposed to smoke or secondhand smoke? Are you exposed to any industrial solvents? Are you exposed to any paints or any nail polish remover? I, I don't know all the things that benzene is in, in but asking the person, you know, where, where might they have been exposed to this? Or BPA binding protein. Do you drink out of plastic? Do you use plastic? Do you have little kids where plastic is everywhere? Do you drink your hot Starbucks coffee through a plastic lid every morning, releasing more BPA? You know, these are some of the things that we want to look at to help somebody in the direction they're going with their lifestyle steps. Um, how about this person? I'm not even going to read them all. But once again, this person has lost tolerance. They've lost chemical tolerance. Their immune system is just hyper reactive to lots of different things. Formaldehyde, isocyanates, trimaletic and phthalic anhydrides, uh, TBBPA, tetrachloroethylene, parabens, like almost everything on this sheet. They And because these are antigens, not self-tissue, their loss tolerance uh, in, that, uh, in that neurological one it's not necessarily that they've lost tolerance. They, they have a response against all those tissues. That's not good. It's going to damage those tissues. These things we want, like a response is good, but a hyperactive response like this is showing that they've lost chemical tolerance uh, and we need to restore chemical tolerance there. Um, and then infections. So this is uh, array 12. It's, you can't see it very well, but I took this slide from... Uh, from Dr. Karazian because it just shows what each of the, the categories are. Uh, some oral pathogens in the mouth, some GI pathogens, like do they have a reaction to candida? Now you can have a candida overgrowth and not have an immune reaction to it. So it's two different things and you've got to correlate those, which is interesting. Like you can have mercury in your mouth and it can be a problem, but you don't always have an immune reactivity to it. You can have H. pylori, Something like 90% of the people in the world, world carry H. pylori. But if you're not reacting to it right now, it's, it's, it's different. Um, parasites, st stealth pathogens, different bacteria that can hide a little bit more. Molds, really, really important. Do you have a reaction to mold? These are all IgG sensitivities that we're looking at here. Um, most mold tests are IgE tests, so which is a true allergy um, it's different. Viruses and tick-borne pathogens, uh, Lyme disease and the co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella. So Cyrex testing, what they have, intestinal permeability, array 2, the gluten and the wheat proteome, array 3X, gliadin, cross-reactive foods, that's array 4, oftentimes those three can be combined. There's chemical triggers, there's pathogen triggers, there's neurological autoimmunity, there's joint autoimmunity, like I mentioned, there's blood-brain barrier permeability testing, there's the new Alzheimer's Lynx test, which I thought I had a slide in here of in the neurological section, um, but it's super cool, it just came out last year, but it's predictive autoantibodies for, for uh, Alzheimer's 
really important. Food sensitivities, you know, we're not talking about food sensitivities in this webinar because I have a whole other webinar on Cyrex food sensitivity testing, but they're the world's leader in food sensitivity testing. Dr. Vijadani uh, invented food sensitivity testing, so they're the, the go-to there. So final word, there are a lot of other tests that could be relevant. I was talking about autoimmune testing and like what tests for autoimmunity, not like what tests should you do if you have autoimmunity. You might need a stool test. You might need an adrenal or a, or a hormone profile. You might need to see your cortisol or you might need to see your testosterone, your estrogens, your etc. cetera. Uh, you might need to see uh, your urinary organic acids to just get a good picture of how your mitochondria are functioning, how well you're detoxing. You might need a genetic profile to see you know, the same things, how well you're detoxing, what, what predispositions you have, etc. You might need a micronutrient test, like a intracellular micronutrient test, like SpectraCell. And those are just looking at, not necessarily like, here's your autoimmune disease, here's what's triggering it, but let's say Sally walks in with an autoimmune disease, well, I'm not treating her rheumatoid arthritis, I'm treating Sally. And rheumatoid arthritis is the diagnosis that's been slapped on it. But first off, like you saw, she might also have Hashimoto's. She might also have anxiety. She might also have constipation. She might also have low energy. Has nothing to do with her rheumatoid arthritis, but it's still all part of Sally. So all these tests are really, really important. And then the last thing at the bottom is the same thing, that autoimmune disease is a super complex puzzle. Every single patient is different. Um, and all of these things, all these lifestyle strategies, all these testing strategies, all these supplement strategies need to be addressed for the rest of the patient's life. So it's not always about like doing five of these panels at the beginning. In fact, that, that can be a bad use of money because by the time you address the first panel, things have changed in the second panel. And so testing as you go along and realizing that this is a marathon and not a sprint and realizing the value of retesting and realizing the value of what we say in our office is the machine gun approach, like you're, you're going to hit something versus the sniper approach of, okay, let's address gut autoimmunity and let's try to heal and seal a leaky gut or let's address the immune imbalance or let's address tolerance or detoxification or whatever the case may be um, for the rest of the person's life. So really, really important to just keep that in mind. But I hope you got something out of this autoimmune disease testing. Uh, it was a lot of, lot of fun and a lot of content to go through. So thank you.